This is the final panel. Now, this is the culmination point. This is the future, the challenge, and the response. This is a session where we really shouldn't leave this room until we've got a list of what we need to complete, what we've got to do, how we get over this, whether it's a problem, and we've had all that great past and present, and we get to a bit of the future challenge and the response. Um, I think what's been interesting for me today, sitting and listening, and I'm a matler, I'm a sailor by background, so, so I find this stuff really interesting, but I come in it a different way. And it's weird that a lot of the conversation has been looking at this in quite a sort of one-dimensional way. You know, we've talked a little bit, we've talked a lot about tactical effects, a lot about kinetic action and big heavy diggers and bridging equipment and all that sort of, you know, great stuff. And we've talked a little bit about information. We've talked, thankfully, a little bit more about stabilisation, about society. We haven't really talked about riverine operations as part of it. You know, using the river. We haven't talked about the underground as much as I thought we might do. We've talked a little bit about the air, but more for I-Star uh, and, and as a threat. And we've sort of perpetuated this notion that we're, you know, that, that we're going to be in a very compliant EMS space, that we'll be able to communicate, that it'll be good, we'll be able to fight the way we want. Um, which I found really interesting, given um, the remarks that certainly uh, David Cullen, Igor, General Hicks, various others gave at uh, the Land Warfare Conference uh, 18 months ago, and hopefully we'll talk about uh, again in June. So it's a little bit different. The other thing that struck me is we are all talking about the urban of somewhere we don't want to fight. Right? That's, that's the impression I get, is that this is the most testing, sucks up manpower, really challenging, frankly, avoid at all costs. I, I just wonder if perhaps we might think about looking at it another way, which is actually this is, the, this is the battle space that we want to use, that we will be the ones defending this, not attacking it. Uh, and therefore, if we reverse that position, what does that give us in terms of both understanding the position of the attacker and their weaknesses and vulnerabilities, but the, our own opportunities to do so. So we need to really open our eyes a little bit at the moment and, and try and broaden this out. And this is your session. Okay, so this is you getting something out of this, if you haven't already. Um, so it, it is very much incumbent on you, and, and that's where we've got the time to do the Q&A uh, at the end. Um, I think the other things that we haven't touched on that I'd be keen that we raise is, you know, there's been no compression, there's no talk about C2, which I find amazing. Any, uh, you know, they're, 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 there's this great tendency of, of many formations and organizations at the moment, as soon as there's a problem that they identify, is to um, create a two star headquarters, uh, give it a name, and, and, you know, and, and believe that it'll be solved. So, you know, maybe we need to talk about C2, maybe we need to talk about a bit of compression, maybe we need to start talking about, you know, does the, you know, uh, close, deep, and rear, does that exist? Is that worthwhile talking about? Does that not exist anymore? Do we still talk about combined arms? Is it integrated? Where's information maneuver in all of this? You know, uh, I, I just think we are short of reaching the point at which we can have a meaningful discussion about that at the moment, and, and we, need to, we need to move it on. We also need to talk a little bit more about people. Uh, and I want to get to that in questions. If you don't raise it, I will be asking you that question. What do our people need to be in the future? What do they need to look like? What do they need to feel like? What skills do they need to have? How do we train them and how do we educate them so that they're able to address this? Um, and I hope that we will get some way down that because, as I said at the start, this is your fight and it will be your fight in 20 years' time and it won't be the people on the stage who are doing it. So, um, there's a whole host of stuff to get through, uh, and we've got four great panellists up here to do the challenge and response. Um, we start off with, and, and you know most of these speakers, and if you don't, I'll give you a, you know, very briefly. David Kilcullen will kick off. Most of you have heard of him before. If you haven't heard of David, read his books, and frankly, I'm not quite sure what you're doing here. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he's the guru on this stuff, so um, David will kick off. Um, then we have CGS's favourite author. Okay, of the moment, uh, David um, uh, Pashkarkos um, has written this uh, fab book, which um, we'll talk about, which takes us into the information space, into the cognitive domain. And if you follow, you know, um, Wilf Owen's points of earlier, you know, this great reductionist theory that nothing's changed, it's all new, you know, you know it, it is forever slowly evolving, but, but it's all the same. Then you bring it back to that single point that what we're after is a cognitive impact. It's not physical, it's not geographic, it's not informational, it's cognitive. And I think David really starts to nail that in his book and takes us some way towards it. So we're looking forward to that. So there's the challenge. This is laying out the challenge of urban in the future, what it means, what it looks like, what it feels like. 
And the response is that um, we are really lucky that um, uh, Chris Tickell as DCAP is coming to, is coming to examine this challenge um, and to talk about what the process is for going about taking it on and to present some of that challenge back to industry and others because it's not simply a, you know, soldiers in uniform answer. Um, so uh, Chris has got that bit, but, but really he's teeing up um, uh, uh, Brigadier Zach. Uh, and Zach has got to be the meat of this response because, you know, as it's been articulated, you know, by CGS time and time again, you know, the strike concept is the heart of the response to this. And, and Zach is the man who's, who's pushing that forward. Um, so um, they're going to do remarks up there on the record take your notes and you know do your records and all the rest of that stuff when they come off and onto the panel session then it is off the record okay so this gives hopefully a bit of freedom to, for people to speak but that's your opportunity to engage so without further ado Dave so for about three years NATO has been looking at the future of uh, urban operations a big driver of that was actually DCDC. UK has been very heavily involved. Um, what I want to do is give you some of the key insights from experimentation and also from the environmental scanning that we've been doing on the NATO project. Um, and I'm going to focus very much on the adversary, the enemy side, primarily because um, Brigadier Zach's got the um, much better uh, than me, the ability to talk about what's happening on, on the Blue Force side. So I'm going to move very quickly. Um, uh, if I'm going too fast, wave your hand at me and I'll just ignore you. Uh, we are going to talk about the city as a system. We're going to talk about a number of areas. Um, we're going to talk about flows through the urban environment as being important. But I'm going to use the term peri-urban, which means the transitional area around the outside of the city, right, the outskirts, the suburbs. We're going to talk about transitional zones and the rural hinterland. Um, these are sort of urban planning terms. But the critical thing to think about here is that a city is not like a chocolate um, chip sitting in a chocolate chip cookie, right? And it's separate from the environment around it. It's completely connected via a system to flows and things that happen in the rural environment, things that happen on the edge of the city, and also things that happen in other cities. And sometimes in the NATO work that we've been, been doing looking at 2035, it turns out that the best way to protect or destroy a city involves not going in there at all, but attacking it through its much wider influence field um, through different cities. So that's a sort of framing comment to start. Second framing comment is the enemy's not the only threat. This is the Fukushima Daiichi reactor melting down in 2011. Cities are full of industrial facilities, chemical plants, um, ports, airports that have toxic chemicals, all kinds of other aspects that mean that in some ways the city itself, particularly a city in crisis, can actually generate environmental threats which depending on the phase of the operation might actually be more important to you than anything that RED uh, is doing. That said, the environment that our adversaries face in now until about 2035 has some pretty common um, characteristics. We tend to have air superiority, but we also have very strict rules of engagement and uh, legal requirements that make it very difficult to bring a, a significantly heavy weight of fire to bear. There's a pervasive electronic surveillance environment, generally in our favor, but there are extremely high traffic volumes, which means that you can hide in the clutter uh, if, you, if you play it right. There's an extraordinarily high degree of connectivity. I talked about that a little bit earlier today. Uh, I'm gonna show you some data in a minute. Uh, cell phones, internet, social media, gaming networks, mesh networks of communication across urban environments that really enable a whole different approach not only to propaganda and influence, but also to command and control and to kinetics. Um, there's, we talked to, I think someone mentioned in the last panel the idea of hugging, I think it was General, General Newton. Um, we're used to insurgents hugging us physically, right? Getting close enough to close the range so that it's danger close, so that we can't use our heavy, heavy systems. What we're seeing with a lot of adversaries in the, in the environment is technological hugging, where they ride along on our GPS and our um, our Google Earth and our other systems that we have become so dependent on that we're not going to shut them down. And that means that they can safely uh, rely on those also. And final sort of environmental comment is when you're dealing with an urban population, you're dealing with a population that has much higher 
technical uh, literacy and mechanical literacy, if you like engineering latency, than a rural population does. And it has access to all kinds of light industry, uh, resources, manufacturing capability, and it can pretty rapidly um, build military-style capabilities that you wouldn't expect within days to weeks uh, in an operating environment. And I'll show you some examples of that. So we talked about the connectivity explosion. Libya in the middle, 19,000% um, increase in, in cell phone ownership since the year 2000. The big one's Nigeria, 280,000% roughly. But I put the US and the UK up on the right-hand side for comparison. So we've seen extraordinarily significant expansion in access to the internet, cell phone systems, satellite television, and so on in the developing world since the beginning of the century. But it's completely dwarfed by what's going on in the developing world, where the environment now is dramatically different to what it was um, even a few years ago. So for example, this is Libya. 2011. This is a homemade multi-barrel rocket launcher. It's a little bit hard to see, but these guys are using an Android cell phone with the Compass app to figure out the azimuth uh, that they're going to use to fire the, um, the, the system on. Innovative in 2011 because even in 2007 there was no cell phone system and there certainly were no smartphones uh, in Libya. So the use of a smartphone in 20, 2011, um, reasonably innovative. This is last year in Syria. Now, it looks superficially the same, but it's completely different. These guys are using an iPad with the Inconometer app to figure out the elevation. They've got the firing tables downloaded onto the iPad, and they've already used the Compass app to lay the azimuth. Much more importantly, they're running Google Earth, and their observer at the other end is also running Google Earth. When they fire their first adjusting rounds, he's going to put a pin into Google Earth, which is going to appear on their iPad, and from that pin, they will go straight to fire for effect from one adjusting round. And that observer doesn't have to be physically located where the shell lands. And in fact, in some examples that I, I mentioned earlier, we've had observers in Belgium and in France controlling the fire of mortar systems in uh, Syria uh, and Iraq. So one of the new things that the connectivity revolution enables is the decoupling of tactical action from physical presence. We're used to that because we do it with drones. The enemy's doing it using our systems. This is a US company. It's a US military satellite system, right? And it's a series of procedures that we developed, which are all being used by these guys. Uh, and of course, the obvious point is that it's even since 2011, dramatically developed uh, in the operating environment. So disruptive technology is a key element of what the, the adversaries are, are applying. This is a quote from a really good book by a guy called Dave Hambling about miniature drones called swarm troopers. And I'll just mention the, the sort of last comment there. He says a drone is basically a smartphone with wings and the wings are the cheap part. Every time there's a development in camera systems or power systems or accelerometers or GPS miniaturization that is done by the guys at Apple or at Alphabet in order to improve consumer electronics, you immediately get a knock-on effect to miniature drones. And so you're getting this very rapid adaptation. And as he says at the beginning of that quote, um, if uh, you start off with uh, a six year cycle for uh, modernization, and you can tell this guy's a journalist because he thinks it only takes six years, um, <laughs> then you know, uh, within, um, within that time you go from being four times better to four times worse than an adversary who's following a commercial development cycle. So with the example of drones, I want to bring in a theme that we see a lot in enemy activity, and that is the insertion of conventional military technology into repurposed consumer technology. So this is a hobby drone. You'll see the obvious little um, plastic tube at the bottom. That is a um, glued on plastic tube with an electromagnet at the top of it, which is linked to the drone. What you do is you take a grenade, you stick the grenade in the tube, you pull the pin, the tube holds the lever, you fly over the target, and then you simply turn the electromagnet off and your grenade falls out. So what you now have is a miniature bomber built around uh, a hobby drone. But the point to make is it only works if you've got access to a lot of grenades, right? It, it's, it's taking a conventional piece of military hardware and repurposing it, plugging it into uh, a different system. Here's another example. This is a Syrian homemade tank in uh, Aleppo. Sloped armor at the front. It's built on a Volkswagen chassis. Goes places that a BMP or a Bradley won't go because it's much smaller. 
you'll see it has these camera, uh, uh, slightly armored um, camera sights on front, um, and it has a camera that's a bit hard to see on the top of the, the weapon uh, that's being remotely controlled above uh, the hull. This is inside, looking through the, the sight picture, right? So you get your flat screen television, you got your, your game controller. It's the repurposing of consumer electronic capability, plus the ability of an urban population to mock up an armored vehicle pretty quickly in a backyard um, light industry home, homemade workshop. But the thing only works because you happen to have a machine gun to hand that you can drop in on top, right? So it, again, it's the insertion of uh, relatively conventional factory made military piece of equipment into a broader system. So with all that for framing, and this is my busiest slide and I apologize, there are sort of 10 things we see in um, the emerging approaches that we're seeing from multiple different adversaries. And to me, this is one of the most interesting things. Um, multiple different groups that there's not a lot of in indication are colluding with each other, are more or less independently coalescing onto the same sorts of uh, operating tools. One is this idea of operating across the full breadth and depth of the urban, peri-urban and rural matrix simultaneously. So they're not fighting urban warfare. They're fighting matrix warfare or nodal warfare. It just happens that a big chunk of that is the urban and they're using presence in the peri-urban or rural or offset nodes uh, to influence an urban environment. Another one is this idea of leaderless resistance, which is a term out of terrorism studies, but um, I think is very well applied to some of the uh, field adversaries that we're dealing with now, where you're looking at acephalous swarms, right? Headless swarms, where there's no headquarters, there's no central command node, there's nothing to kill. So if you think about Fuller's Plan 1919, which is a you know, deep penetration of an armored thrust looking for the headquarters to do the pistol shot through the brain, there's no brain in this, in this type of maneuver. And that makes uh, an organization much more prone to error, but it also makes it much more survivable. Um, the infestation, which is an Israeli term, of the urban environment, where people are embedding in physical structures, maneuvering in hollow or interior spaces, uh, and uh, also hiding in the social media and the, the informational clutter uh, and the population. So it, it basically disappearing into the, the woodwork and fighting from that position rather than coming out to fight, remaining embedded. A very large number of multi-role small platforms rather than a small number of very capable platforms, right? So think technicals instead of tanks. Lots of them, individually not very capable. A lot of them get killed, but you might be dealing with 200 in a swarm instead of, you know, 20. Um, modular organizations to the lowest level, uh, usually combat pairs. So organizations built up from the pair rather than built down uh, from the division. Cooperative and remote engagement. We already gave the example of the guys with the remote observer. This is um, in increasingly common in direct fire as well as indirect fire where the shooter is offset from the weapon. Um, cyber kinetic operations. Operations where you are carrying out a cyber operation in order to achieve a physical effect or a physical operation in order to achieve a cyber effect where cyber is not a standalone uh, element of the fight but it's just an adjunct maneuver space and the commander turns to his right hand side and sees his fire controller and to his left and sees the cyber controller and the three of them come up with a joint uh, approach. Um, that is increasingly common and it's something that um, we can talk examples in, in Q&A. Um, improvisable capabilities, 3D printing is the obvious one but there are others that allow this technological hugging that we've talked about um, and, and enable that high uh, latent technological capacity in the population. Diaspora linkages. When you attack somebody in Mogadishu, as I mentioned earlier, they may not re retaliate in Mogadishu. They may retaliate in Minnesota. Um, they may, if, when you, if you're the French and you go into Operation Saval, one of the big ways the enemy can re retaliate against you is in France through diaspora linkages, through terrorism, um, through the ability to, uh, to transfer knowledge and targeting information and so on. Um, the emergence of no-go and no-see areas, not in any way new, but what's happening here is the, uh, the enemies figured out that they control urban operations not by occupation, but by interdiction. And therefore the belts around urban environments matter more than the, the urban core. So if we think about the urban defense, 
um, some of the things we're seeing from the experimentation and the environmental scan. Enemies are less focused on area defense of the urban environment, more on actively defending the surrounding rural belts. Um, they may not uh, hold the center of a city very densely. That may be the economy of force, and the main effort may be withheld and have a stronger counterattack and QRF force uh, operating in the belts. There's been little tendency, with a couple of exceptions, um, to uh, fight to the last stand. Mostly, um, it's area denial, active or flexible defense, giving up territory, and then re-infiltrating to attack again. Um, they're likely to fade away uh, in the face of a strong attack, but then engage in pretty rapid uh, counterattacks, very active patrolling. There's a huge amount of riverborne uh, and seaborne operations, uh, not just things like Mumbai, but you know, a huge amount of, ri of riverine operations happened uh, in Iraq uh, and a certain amount in, in Syria as well. And I would also point out, you know, Professor Beaver's probably got more detail on this, but there's a very significant riverine element to the Battle of Stalingrad, which we didn't really talk much about this morning, but uh, that was a huge component of, of the Russian uh, operation. Uh, this is a tele-operated sniper rifle captured near Kirkuk in 2015. There's a whole bunch of tech int work um, and open source stuff going on about tele-operated systems. This is an early model where it's cord based and all you're doing is offsetting the sniper from the weapon by about 20, 20 feet. Now you can have a guy, and this is a real example, sitting in an internet cafe in Europe with half a dozen uh, weapon systems up on his, on his laptop controlling multiple um, sites. And of course anyone that's ever done any sniper training knows that snipers mostly are actually an intelligence gathering asset and a, a control uh, asset. And the, the shoot is important, but it's not the only thing that a, that a sniper does. So what you're doing by apply, applying this approach is preserving that brain that's really important, that has the normality pattern and knows what's going on in the urban environment, but offsetting them to a different direction. And you have women and children moving these assets around, resupplying them with uh, ammunition, um, being unarmed 99% of the time and therefore untouchable for us. And it's a, it's a method of maintaining the system long term. Tactics in the urban attack. Reflexive control, which is a, a Russian term, but we're seeing it from not just Russians. The idea that your information operation is not designed to convince the enemy of anything in particular. It's designed to put them in a cognitive box, right? And I'll use one example, which is probably a bit politically incorrect. There's a huge amount of argument going on in the United States right now about whether the Russians conducted uh, an influence operation during the 2016 uh, election. The debate and the, the controversy and the fact that everybody's locking on that one, that is the information operation. It's still going on. You're in the box, right? But you're being convinced that it's something that already happened uh, two years ago. So that's an idea of this sort of cognitive control or reflexive control idea, which we're seeing increasingly uh, in, in urban attack. Um, use of terrorism to manipulate or fix the defender. The classic example being the capture of Mosul in uh, 2010. Uh, sorry, in 2014, where the enemy used several months of terrorist attacks on a variety of different locations to fix the Iraqi defenders in a series of garrison and guard locations, which A, pissed the population off, B, soaked up their reserves, so they went from having a battalion reserve to having a platoon reserve on the day, and C, um, lulled them into a sense of security that, yeah, we're going to get just another small terrorist attack and we've got the right lay down to deal with that. And then on the 10th of June, 800 ISIS guys with tanks turned up and took the city in a day because there was no reserve because they'd, over time, socialised them to a different set of threats than what they were dealing with. Um, urban, peri-urban and rural network cells are being used to support conventional manoeuvre forces. I'm going to give you an example of that from Afghanistan in a minute. Urban siege, we just saw it with the Inter Intercontinental Hotel in Kabul, but it's increasingly common where your raiding group doesn't raid and then withdraw. They raid, fortify, stay as long as possible, try to generate maximum disruption, and if you like, attack the city itself as a target. Um, baited ambushes on relief forces, sabotage and denial of a variety of, of, of forces. Uh, we've talked a lot about IEDs, so I won't go into them in more detail. This is Kunduz, September 2015. After months of logistic and diplomatic pressure, the uh, Taliban put uh, about 12 different guerrilla groups into the city. They infiltrate, hide in the peri-urban, wait for the Eid holiday, and then 
three conventional columns attacked the city from three different directions overnight, and the guerrillas attacked the key objectives from behind. This could be the Tet Offensive 1968. Um, could be any other, uh, you know, of, of these, but it's, it's now technologically enabled. It's captured on Twitter. Uh, it has a major effect on morale within a day. Nearly finished, mate. Um, the common tool that we see in both attack and defence is the hybrid force modular tactical swarm, right? Four to five vehicles, six to eight dismounts per vehicle, usually a heavy weapon on the vehicle. They apply very fluid, light cavalry tactics, usually two to three sniper um, style uh, indirect weapons. They often have captive drones, um, not usually one, usually several, um, sometimes loitering munitions. Cyber capabilities are often embedded, and then you've got various specialist teams, anti-armor kill teams, um, IEDs, EW teams. Um, I won't talk about that in the interest of time, but I want to go to my last slide, which is we have been talking, I think, a little bit glibly today about peer or peer plus adversaries. And somebody said in the last uh, session, we're going to be talking about enemies that are applying absolutely every capability in their arsenal. Except we're not, are we? Because we haven't talked about nukes. What does this look like when your enemy is willing to use tactical nuclear weapons? What does it look like when you're fighting North Korea in a North Korean environment that's now contaminated or you're fighting in Seoul that's been subjected to major artillery barrage but it has had at least one or two uh, tac nukes go off? What do you do when you're fighting an adversary who treats uh, nuclear weapons, particularly tactical nu nuclear weapons, as just big artillery? Uh, and I think we do need to, if we're going to think seriously about the future urban challenge, we have to take everything we've been talking about today and say, okay, how do we do that in a nuclear environment? Okay, with that very happy thought, I'll leave you on with that. And go from there. David, as ever, um, a, a brilliant. It, interesting, though, to, to note that it's not just the low-tech stuff that, that is really interesting to see, but you know, there's been this proliferation, this democratization of really high-tech weaponry. You know, Houthi rebels operating multi-million pound, very sophisticated cruise missiles, operating ballistic missiles, firing them against uh, another state. You know, it's the Iranian version of by, with, and through, uh, and some could argue they're doing it slightly more successfully than, than us. So, moving on. David, um, please. Thank you. <coughs> uh, excuse me, I've got a slight uh, sore throat. So good afternoon. It's an honor to be here at Rusi. And looking around at all the fine uh, women and men in uniform, I do feel rather underdressed, I have to say. Now, the reason I'm here is that, I, the reason I was invited, I think, I was recently delighted and stunned, actually, to see that General Sir Nicholas Carter had quoted from my book in a recent speech he gave. So I thought I'd, or well, I was asked actually, to structure this talk a little bit around his comments. So to quote him quoting me. So this is him, this is him, this is him now. I think it's important that we build on the excellent foundation we've created for information warfare through our 77 Brigade, which is now giving us the capability to compete in the war of narratives at the tactical level. And as David Patrick Arakos put it in his recently published book, War in 140 Characters, available on Amazon, in, w in which he observes on the war in Ukraine. I, this is me now, I was caught up in two wars. One fought on the ground with tanks and artillery and an information war, fought largely, though not exclusively, through social media. And counterintuitively, it seemed to matter more who won the war of words and narratives than who had the most potent weaponry. He also observed, that's me again, social media is throwing up digital supermen, hyper-connected and hyper-empowered online individuals. And I'd like a few of those in 77 Grivade, please. <clears throat> so, to start briefly at the beginning. Now, I first became aware that things had changed when I entered eastern Ukraine in the spring of 2014. Now, to give a bit of background, just four years earlier, I'd covered some of the conflict in the Congo, and it was like covering a war in a different century. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I realized in eastern Ukraine that Twitter had more up-to-date information than the BBC or CNN, that individuals and not institutions became my primary source of information on the ground. So as I was moving from one occupied city to the next, in order to see what was safe, what the best road to travel through was, I wouldn't check the BBC, I would look at Twitter, I would look at people, what people were saying. 
Now, as summer drew in, if you remember 2014, it was a quite a bad summer. Uh, Daesh, the terrorist group Daesh, exploded into global headlines when it took Iraq's second largest city, Mosul. Then in July, Israel launched Operation Protective Edge, and another Gaza war began. Now, it didn't matter that I was in Donetsk or Kiev, far from English language media. Gaza's bloody destruction was smeared across my laptop, smeared across my phone, uh, in endless videos and photos that filled my Twitter and Facebook feeds each day. Um, you know, war had never been so close, visceral, or ubiquitous to me. On jihadist forums, Daesh members in Syria recruited teenagers from Birmingham to join them in their fight. Social media, I understood, had opened up to the individual vital spaces of communications once controlled almost exclusively by the state. And I, again, come to the quote that I was caught up in two wars. I also realized that the Kremlin's information war, just like those of the IDF and Hamas and indeed Daesh, was actually, oddly enough, to me, largely aimed at a global audience, as opposed to, as you perhaps might want to expect, the enemy population. And at the center of this, one thing shone out, the ability of social media to empower ordinary individuals, especially non-combatants, with the power to alter both the physical battlefield and the discourse around it. Everyone, it seemed, could be an actor of some sort in a war. What I was witnessing, it seemed to me, was virtual mass enlistment. And the bars to entry for the enlistment were almost none. All you need is a smartphone. Almost, barring certain parts of Africa and, let's say, North Korea, everyone pretty much has a smartphone. So I decided to write this, my book, as I, available on Amazon, while lying on my bed in a bleak room in the Ramada Hotel in Donetsk, listening to the shelling. Like so many in this room, though I really must stress, nowhere near to the same degree. I've seen war up close and personal in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, in Africa. And it's clear to me that we need to at least consider new narratives that take into account the way social media is transforming the way wars are waged, covered, and consumed. What I was seeing from Ukraine to Gaza to Iraq was a gradual erosion of wars, wars like World War II uh, in which sovereign states fought, uh, there was a clear winner and a clear loser, and a political settlement. Uh, Putin, for example, had no interest in defeating Ukraine militarily, which he easily could have done, and forcing it to accept the annexation of, U of Ukraine, eastern Ukraine. Israel had no intention of de defeating Hamas militarily. Now, this is not new. Uh, you know, not every war is fought to defeat the enemy totally. Uh, and then, but then you have things like uh, terrorist groups like Daesh, whose you know whose only demand was that you know. Syria, Iraq, the rest of the Middle East, and then the world dismantle their states and absorb themselves into their caliphate. That is to say, demands that are self-evidently impossible to compromise on, and as such, never can be resolved without, uh, through negotiation. So without total victory, in this case, annihilation, uh, the conflict will not end. And, you know, Daesh is an interesting example because as much as its physical caliphate is shrinking, what is happening is it's merely shifting to its virtual caliphate. And, you know, Daesh is, is more than a terrorist group. It's a brand. It's a franchise. So as it loses on the ground in the Middle East, it expands to, to Britain and to France and to Belgium, etc. Now, we live in a post-1945 security system that was designed to regulate war out of existence, basically. Organizations like the EU, the UN, were, you know, formed with this intention pretty much at their heart. The emergence of nuclear weapons, again, has also made it harder for states to use force to compel their enemy to do their will for peer of escalation. So this security order has, at least in the West, seen a decline on state-on-state -state compact and, you know, almost total absence of direct war between two major powers. But the urge to fight predates civilization itself. It cannot be regulated out of existence. War, like a virus, must mutate to survive. So what I saw in Ukraine, rather than militarily defeating Ukraine, Moscow seemed concerned, in fact obsessed, with getting eastern Ukrainians to subscribe to a narrative. Namely, that the Kiev government was a fascist junta out to speak, out to persecute Russian-speaking Ukrainians and to destroy the speaking of Russia in Ukraine. Now, and it was effective. Uh, Marshall McLuhan said that all media are extensions of some human faculty, uh, psychic or physical. Now, in eastern Ukraine, it was as if Putin's central nervous system was on display. 
old men parroted, you know, geopolitical concepts like Novorussia, a czarist term to, you know, to describe parts of southern East Ukraine that they clearly didn't understand. And it was honestly, you have to, it was like being with the Moonies. I would go from you know, city to city and I would hear the same thing. Fascist junta, fascist junta, right sector, a far right group, are surrounding the town. They've come with snipers, they're going to kill us. That they had got from, from TV, the older generation. Younger generation would show me their smartphones, you know, with racist memes of, of President Obama, all this sort of stuff. It wasn't merely the promulgation of the narrative. It was the reinvention of reality. I mean, these people sincerely believe this. And you have to understand, I mean, this is, we are talking about two cities within the same country. This is a country, an industrial country like Donetsk in the east, sincerely believing that the, yeah, its capital city is out to destroy it. Now, the boundaries between politics and war have always been close. But it seemed to me they had become blurred be almost beyond belief. Now, propaganda is almost, I mean, propaganda is not, it's, it's as old as war itself. But traditionally, generally, the tendency has been for propaganda operations to support military operations on the ground. What I thought I was seeing, what I was seeing in Ukraine, was military operations on the ground designed to support op uh, propaganda operations on TV and in cyberspace. That is to say, Putin sent in tanks and soldiers you know, to clear a space in eastern Ukraine to essentially destabilize it. And how did he want to destabilize it? Through narratives, that is to say, through propaganda. Now, as Will said earlier, what my experience has taught me is that, you know, what has changed is not war itself. Okay, technology changes, but fundamentally, soldiers still fire on soldiers, tanks fire at tanks, planes fight in the air. And, you know, Mad Dog, General Mad Dog Mattis may have been right when he declared that Alex, sick, the great, would not be in the least perplexed by the enemy that we face right now in Iraq. But he failed in that, as esteemed a man as he is, as esteemed a soldier as he is, the changing context in which the war is now fought, which has been changed by the speed and interconnectivity of contemporary globalization driven by the information revolution. Just look, for example, at the degree of global financial integration that we have, that it allows us to, to, to wage war through non-military means. The capacity has never been greater. Look at the sanctions on Russia following its invasion of Ukraine. You can argue they're insufficient or they didn't go far enough, but the role of non-kinetic means to make war has increased beyond all, all, um, uh, beyond, you know, all recognition. And it's dangerous in the sense that what this brings is a breaking down of the boundaries between war and peace. Uh, because the more war becomes the practice of politics, and indeed economics, it has no clear end because politics never ends. Now, and more open-ended conflicts have far greater potential to slip into outright war involving multiple states. Now, at the centre of these challenges, and this is where we come to the thesis of my book, stands not just globalisation and the information revolution, but more specifically, the social media and networking technologies this has brought. Twitter and Facebook are the platforms from which most young people now get their news from, and they get it in real time, especially when they want news in real time. And nowhere do news events happen in real time as they do in times of crisis like war. Social media has changed the way that wars are fought in the sense that it has endowed people with two crucial abilities. First, to actively produce content, and second, through the social news of media platforms, to form transnational networks, abilities that enable them to shape events, especially in times of civil strife and war. Now, I met Alec Ross, who is the former senior advisor for innovation to Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State. And he, he outlined what I believe is the fundamental shift that is taking place. He told me, and I quote, power is moving from hierarchies to city. Hierarchy is a major institution like a government or a major media corporation. From hierarchies uh, to citizens and networks of citizens. And the kinds of capabilities that would once have been reserved for large media organizations or for nation states have suddenly become available to networks of individuals. Now, since the Arab Spring, we've seen the emergence of a new type of hyperpower individual, hyperpowered individual, networked, globally collected, and more per potent than ever before. A uniquely 21st century phenomenon I term homo digitalis. And this was one of those things where I thought, oh my God, I've come up with this phrase, I'm brilliant. 
Then I went on Google and it was like, oh, someone else has done it before. But I don't think people have actually used it in quite this sense. And actually, this is something that if there is any interest, I'd like to return to in the Q&A. Now, from Ukraine to Gaza to Syria, the power of homo digitalis is plain to see. It, in the sense that he, and indeed she, although homo, it has to be he in this case, not, you know, uh, it's, you know, has irrevocably changed the relationship between the individual and the state. The 20th century nation state traditionally held primacy in two areas from it derived much of its power. First was its near monopoly on the use of force, and second, its near total control of information flows. And you saw it reach an apex, for example, during World War II when, when in Britain, for example, you know, media and government worked totally in tandem for obvious reasons. Um, now, the emergence of social media platforms has created new forums that allow people to communicate outside traditional state hierarchies of communications, such as state or even privately owned, uh, but state permitted newspapers, radio and TV. When this happens, new avenues of power are created that empower the individual and challenge the nation state. Now, because these forums are structurally more egalitarian, many see the internet, specifically social media, as the ultimate tool against tyrants. It's what the author Evgeny Morozov terms type cyber utopianism, the belief that the internet favors the oppressed rather than the oppressor. Now, he correctly terms it cyber utopianism because just as homo digitalis challenges the state, the state will always fight back. While Ukrainians uploaded photos of Russian military hardware crossing the border, the Russian state used the same platforms to spread its counter-narrative. Social media wielded by both homo digitalist and the state has unleashed great power into warfare. Who wins this battle will, my thesis, determines who wins or at least is successful in many of the conflicts to come. New media has expanded the arena of conflict into a virtual world, which is becoming almost, a bit, almost, a, a, almost every bit as real as the fighting on the ground. Now, whether you are a president, a soldier, or a terrorist, if you don't understand how to effectively deploy the power of social media, you will suffer in conflicts. And the need to understand this idea is urgent. It's cliche to, true to say that the 20th century nation state is dead, but it's important to remember that this nation state was atypical in its centralization, especially its ability to control information flows, as I suffered by encouraging people to consume state-sanctioned TV, newspapers, and radio. In creating new venues that allow people to communicate outside these states, what we've actually done is spawned, ironically, a reversal, a regression from centralized communicative modes to the more chaotic networks of an earlier age. Before 20th, state, 20th century nation states emerged, statehood was a looser and more decentralized affair. In 1860, for example, only half of France's population spoke French as a first language. And these new wars I witnessed seemed, you know, new wars, inverted commas, seemed in their fluidity and chaos to be more like the wars of the early modern periods. Now, history shows us that with each major new evolution in information technology comes a period of great instability, often leading to conflict. The invention of the printing press, for example, in the 15th century brought subsequent wars of religion to Europe. Once it enabled the mass publication of the Bible, which subsequently translated from Latin into the vernacular language of states, gave the Catholic Church no longer a monopoly, led to the wars of religion. 1920 saw the mass expansion of radio, which a mere decade, uh, TV and radio. A mere decade later gave the demagogues of the 1930s a platform on which to flourish. Then we got World War II. Now, I'm not saying there's a big war coming, but I'm talking about the general instability. November you know, 2016 saw the election of Donald Trump, arguably the most demagogic politician in, in history, who employed Twitter as his essential you know, communicative mode. You know, I always say, think about Obama, what do you remember? The speeches. Think about Trump, what do you remember? The tweets. Unless he's insulted someone in the speech, but it's different. So social media, again, has decentralized um, communication, it has made things more unstable. And the, pro and, it is, and the problem we face is twofold, in that the boundaries between politics and warfare have become blur ever more blurred, and politics, at least since World War II, has never been so unstable. The rise of social media, an inherently destabilizing technology, has coincided with a time of crisis in the West, which since the early 2000s has seen the systematic discrediting of its major institutions. And you can, you can catalog this almost in a linear fashion. 
So, you know, 2003, our politicians lied. They took us to war against Iraq on, on fantasy weapons of mass destruction. 2008, the financial establishment was crooked and brought us the Great Recession. Then come the Snowden NSA revelations. The security establishment is discredited. And you combine this with longer, you know, longer term declining standards of trust in the media. I mean, in, in Britain, we had the phone hacking. We had all this sort of stuff. You know, mainstream established institutions have never been so discredited, I'm saying, in modern times. And you see, you know, the inevitable. Gert Wilders rises, Le Pen rises, uh, Farage rises, and Trump wins the US presidency. I would say the most demagogic candidate to actually become president, or perhaps not the most to actually run for president. Coterminous with this has been the rise of sort of postmodernism within our academic institutions and its lack of belief in a knowable truth. Now, this has allowed both the lies of the Kremlin and, indeed, Trump to flourish. Now, one thing I say is, you know, what, you know Oxford in 2000, the Oxford Dictionaries in 2000 called post-truth the, the phrase of the year. But, you know, what I would say that is relevant to conflict is the political aspect, which is Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump are very different. For all Trump's world, they're very different men. One is a dictator in all but name. The other still leads the world's most powerful democracy. But in both cases... The goal is the same in one area, which is not to twist the truth or lie like the politicians of old, but to subvert the notion, the very idea that an objective truth exists at all. So we go from Bill Clinton, who said, I never had sexual relations with that woman, a lie, to Donald Trump or his spokesman, who comes out and says, my own organization crowds were bigger than Obama's, when you can see that they weren't. And what happens when they're called out on this? They say, well, we're just giving you alternative facts. This is the problem we need to address, and address it sooner rather than later. And the answer, I argue, lies in the exploitation of homo digitalis. Thank you. You know, that's, that's a heck of a challenge. It's the, it's the unwar, the non-peace, the, you know, how the enemy's taking us on. I mean, this is a, you know, just chaotic, fluid, nutty kind of a place to live. Uh, and, and, you know, some of us just live in it. Some of you got to do something a bit more. So, General Chris, you know, how do you deal with this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, great privilege uh, to be here, and thank you for inviting me uh, to say a few words. Um, what Zach and I will try and do is get after some of, of how we're trying to deal with some of the challenges uh, we face, both, both now and over the next 10 years, and really try to drive into the anticipation and implementation challenge that General Sapul laid out earlier, recognizing that we will always need to adapt uh, because, as we all know, uh, the conflict that we face will never be quite uh, what we planned for. Just so that we're all clear, my focus absolutely is on the fight to not, uh, tomorrow. Uh, Zach's is on uh, the fight tonight. Um, but uh, our work is absolutely uh, mutually supportive, uh, and indeed, ultimately, I own the experimentation plan that Zach and his brigade are so expertly refining uh, and delivering. So we, we talk a lot, and I think we are definitely trying to lesson, learn the lessons uh, as we go forward. When you're talking about the future force, uh, it's very easy to get wrapped up in what I would describe as totemic platforms, whether it be Ajax, uh, Upgraded Warrior, Upgraded Challenger 2, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but actually, in many ways, for me, the greater challenge is getting the conceptual approach right. As CGS has articulated many times, uh, the threat is changing at pace, uh, technology is advancing relentlessly, uh, and the character of conflict uh, changing markedly, not least uh, in the growing likelihood that we will operate uh, in the urban uh, and complex terrain more widely more often in the future. And against this backdrop, uh, even with a whole force of up to 140,000, we must also attend to the challenge of delivering sufficient combat mass uh, at the point of need. Now, the, la the latter can be addressed or mitigated through a number of means, uh, not least by using the whole force, uh, but also through interoperability, by improving uh, tooth-to-tail ratios, uh, working with indigenous forces, uh, and, of course, through greater use uh, of autonomy, uh, which I'll touch on later. 
But the combination uh, of all these changes uh, has been the driving force for the development of a new way of operating uh, as we see it. And this work is expressed uh, through Conceptual Force Land 35, which is an analytical concept uh, which many of you have been involved in. Uh, and the work, of course, draws on the agile warrior and urban warrior work uh, that was started by General Sir Paul Newton in 2011 and carries on today. The concept sets out the rationale for change, a generic new force structure and equipment that would enable success. It's based upon the manoeuvrist approach, but tuned to focus absolutely on the urban. And in this way, by cohering a conceptual approach to the challenge, we develop a better way for fighting in the urban. The doctrinal premise will shape our training and tactics and looks to configure a force that is generating tempo at its heart, that is designed to fight dispersed, which can challenge the enemy in the land, air and cyber domains and understands the balance between close and deep operations. Finally, it focuses on a reversion to mission command as originally uh, designed, whereby a mission, intent and scheme of manoeuvre and resourcing offset the need for constant communication. But in the shorter term, we're also looking to examine how we can adapt the Army's elements of Joint Force 25 that was announced in SDSR 15, based on the threat, not least in the urban environment. New technologies will allow us to significantly improve soldiers' survivability, lethality, and situational awareness, which will offer particular advantage in the urban. We also anticipate starting to fit uh, more of our platforms and systems to make them autonomous, albeit mindful, of course, of UK policy that a human must remain in the firing chain. On the one hand, this will probably allow us to use these systems more aggressively and take greater risk. And on the other, of course, uh, by using uh, uh, logistic vehicles, uh, we can get after some of the challenges of combat service support within the uh, urban, urban environment. And finally, greater automation in the short term will allow our headquarters to operate at a higher tempo, both by allowing them to control more subordinates and by improving their, improving their situational awareness and decision support systems to allow us to make decisions more rapidly based on better information. Importantly, everything that I've just outlined will be rigorously tested uh, over the next few uh, months uh, and to, to, to two years through both live and virtual experimentation. And that will ensure that our force development decisions we make are based on objective evidence. And hence, Zach and his brigade's pivotal role, not just in, fight, in improving our fight tonight capabilities, but absolutely helping to shape the future force too. So it's within this context that I absolutely agree that we must be better prepared to operate successfully in complex terrain, and especially the urban environment. But let us not forget that we don't always get to choose uh, the ground of our choice, and indeed the enemy and indeed the ground itself sometimes chooses for us. So whilst we must focus on the urban, it can't be at the cost of credibility in the rural, literal, or other niche environments. Broad utility will remain a key planning consideration for the future. And therefore the debate, say, on elevation uh, of a main battle tank, its main armament, is not quite as straightforward as it might be. Because of course, as you well know, uh, if you deliver greater uh, elevation in a main, uh, main armament, then that has all kinds of connotations in terms of both the design of the tank and then how it's operated out with uh, complex terrain. But I absolutely recognize that the urban challenge is arguably the ultimate blend of hard and soft power. Information activities, close combat, and stabilization take intellect and nuance to deliver. Force elements such as 77 Brigade and the ISR Brigade are very well placed to exploit the complexities of the urban and provide a degree of situational awareness while supporting information maneuver. And we should be clear that it is only with a blend of capability that we will get close to success uh, in the future. So beyond the conceptual force work and attendance experimentation, we have a number of initiatives running. Firstly, RUSI themselves are kindly currently working on a project entitled Operational Physics of Urban Warfare, as we simply need to better understand what the urban fight means in terms of force ratios, combat mass, sustainment, 
and protecting those that require our help. We mustn't assume it's just a kinetic fight, as our actions will require a degree of understanding of how to persuade, coerce, or force the population in a manner that supports our end state. Secondly, uh, we are recasting our approach to collective training. Whilst there are a number of drivers for this work, including placing international by design at its heart, one of the key outcomes will be significantly enhanced urban training facilities, including simulated facilities, available both at the local and national level, instrumented, adequately populated, and supported by a sophisticated simulation wrap. Troops will be much better prepared for the urban fight as a result. Thirdly, we have now just launched the Army's Rapid Innovation and Experimentation Laboratory, uh, which sits uh, within Rob Sargent's organization uh, as head of Future Force Development. Its purpose is to drive innovation uh, in a way that currently we are unable to deliver or have been unable to deliver in the Army to date. Its purpose uh, further is to drive speedier decision making and then take those decisions uh, into action. Uh, ECAB, the Army Board, has agreed to put money behind it so that it will allow me, ultimately as Director of Capability, uh, supporting the field army to deliver capability enhancements, unlocking some of the uh, rather more tortuous and traditional acquisition methods uh, that we all uh, know and sometimes love. However, uh, a key piece uh, of the undefined jigsaw in dealing with the urban challenge is probably, as I see it, a new capability. As yet, undesigned or even perhaps imagined that will help us unlock the urban challenge. To do this, and building on that theme of innovation, we must be truly innovative. In the same way as the Land Ship Committee in 1915 developed the tank, or Winston Churchill's 32-word memo delivered the Mulberry Harbors for June 1944, or even how Barnes Wallace dogmatically experimented until his bombs bounced into the Ruhr Dam. I can imagine that as a system that is not constrained by ground manoeuvre, is fast, has sensors and the ability to engage whilst being cheap and whilst being cheap enough to be sacrificial. It will provide situational awareness and fires and get to places that foot soldiers cannot reach. It must not be exquisite and it, or expensive and it must be cheap and plentiful. But if we can crack that challenge, I absolute, with a new uh, doctrinal premise and training, then I think we will start to get at some of the enduring lessons or truths of urban warfare that Sir Anthony uh, so brilliantly highlighted this morning. And as part of that challenge, uh, we are running this year an exercise called Autonomous Warrior Land uh, in the autumn, where we will see what industry uh, can offer us in some pretty testing scenarios and conditions. Indeed, at the moment, we've got over 70, 70 companies committed with many different capabilities being put forward. Uh, and along with them, we have many of our international partners now taking part. But the key for me in terms of running that experiment is how we then exploit the findings, because uh, ultimately I will be held to account for delivering some of those capabilities at pace uh, into the field army to help both, of course, General Nick Borton uh, and Brigadier Zach uh, as they drive into the challenge we're describing. But I also intend to challenge, and, uh, challenge industry and academia to go even further via what I've described as our new force development nexus, which launches in May. Uh, this will provide me uh, with direct access to multiple players uh, and our allies and our partners on a 24-7 basis. <coughs> which will allow us to get the best ideas from across, frankly, across the world, whether it be the science and technology community or whatever, and turn them into some of these ideas and then action. Thus, meeting the challenge of urban warfare for me as director capability requires the development of a new concept and doctrine so that we can provide the equipment for a new force structure and way of fighting that will deliver success on operations. This is absolutely a combined activity. It's not just me, it's not just Brigadier Zach, it is the whole community, I would suggest, in here and much wider that's gonna to start uh, to deal with the challenge if we need to do with it, uh, do so at pace. We have a, a battlefield staff ride running uh, in Berlin 
this summer, and I hope really we to use that as a further stepping stone for understanding how we can unlock uh, some of those challenges. What's for sure is it will take significant intellectual energy uh, to deliver uh, on meeting this proposition, and I would be very, very grateful uh, for your support. Uh, if I metaphorically leave now, but I will just leave you, uh, say one final thing, i.e. it's off the record. Um, General Sir Paul talked about the debate about where we should pitch uh, our urban um, uh, level of ambition. Uh, and key to that work was that the sort of the general uh, mean point of impact was about the army felt that we were about two out of 10. We then, as a result of that work, we had a very clear debate uh, at board level uh, earlier last year uh, to discuss whether actually we, that was acceptable to be at two out of 10 or actually whether we wanted to go as far as eight out of 10 uh, or somewhere in the middle. What was absolutely clear uh, is that two out of 10 uh, was not good enough. And I think and hope that some of what I've just said and what Brigadier Zach will say absolutely plays to that. But I would also recommend, remind people that utility is key. And therefore, going as far as eight out of 10 is a real challenge for us that we need to be very careful about uh, before we go that far. Thank you very much. So, General Chris, thank you. And just to uh, reassure the Army members of the audience, there's one experiment we don't need to do. It's on these jumpers. I am absolutely melting. Um, it's an incredible honor to be here. Just so you understand who I am, I'm a, I'm a, a brigade commander in the British Army. I'm a tactical ground maneuver commander uh, inside the 3rd United Kingdom Division. You've heard General Nick uh, make some comments earlier. I wasn't planning to deliver strike on my own. So uh, thanks to General Chris and thanks to all of you in the audience for helping us on the strike journey. Uh, what I do wish today, though, is just to update you on what we're experiencing and learning uh, about getting at the urban challenge. I was going to start off with my own experience, which started in Iraq in 2007. And along with many of you in this audience, there's some great veterans who we fought alongside. Uh, it was a challenging first three months for our tour in one brigade, but the last three months of 19 brigade in the first six months of 2007. We all faced constant battles to seize and reseize the initiative by day and night against a state-backed hybrid militia. It was exhausting, bloody and chaotic. It involved the full range of air, land, maritime, non-conventional forces, information maneuver and operating next to and through indigenous forces. I personally found it far, far more challenging uh, than operating in Afghanistan and one where rad rapid adaptation was critical, with an exceptional level of mission command being exercised at all levels from private soldier up to formation commander in a fast-moving and very dynamic environment. We learned, as David has just educated today, that cities are systems and that smart manoeuvre, smart manoeuvre, was key. And the most difficult challenge was breaking into and back out of the city. Uh, on single and multiple axes. Whilst we all learnt and adapted in contact, and many of our friends and colleagues are no longer here today or bear the scars of that fighting, we did become proficient tactically, but we failed to capture all the lessons. The drawdown from Iraq and a more, off, more, more rural focus in Afghanistan meant that urban fighting competency became secondary to winning a counterinsurgence campaign. We heard that from General Paul today. Whilst low-level TTPs were maintained, the experience of planning at scale was missed for maybe four to five years. And you probably already detected today the accusation of a slumbering. And whilst that may be a fair observation, I would categorically say we have not been completely asleep and there is a rapid awakening. I think I'd say that as uh, GOC 3 does has highlighted, both the 3rd Division and 12th Brigade, my own brigade, 20th Brigade, and many brigades across the wider army have been operating in and around the urban on exercises and thinking about it. And I was just reflecting on a question earlier, if I sort of retract back, it was probably around about 2014 that the reset of the divisional level, where the likes of General, General Mungo, Anthony and others in the audience kept reminding us, we don't have a choice about the urban. The urban will choose us and we must be ready for it. As some of you know, may know in the audience, our Commander Field Army, General Patrick, 
uh, who many of you may know fought uh, during that period in 2007, has directed his war dev priority this year to be the urban. And we all conducted an urban stop take two weeks ago under ACOS Warfare, uh, and we've been pulling a plan together to accelerate into this activity. We've been watching closely and learning from the experiences of Mosul, Raqqa, and Marawi. And what I want to give you now is the prism of the experimental brigade, what we're discovering. I'll give you an outline of my brigade's journey and how we, amongst many others in the room, are catalyzing activity from the shop floor. And I'll describe how the next year ahead looks. I want to be clear about what our objective is. A British army that is more competitive, more competitive in combined arms maneuver within 21st century complex terrain, competitive. Not forgetting that we must be capable of wide area maneuver as well, noting that woods and forests are equally as challenging. And our experience of OPCRIBRIT, the forward deployed forces in Estonia, is forcing us to rewrite our fighting in woods and forest doctrine. And Sticky's very great and succinct analogy, Fobua and Fibua. And one final piece of context before our start. We're not planning on doing this on our own. Absolutely not. Throughout, we're planning to leverage the full capabilities of WANDIV, Force Troops Command, and Joint Forces, Coalition, Allies, by, with, and through Indigenous Forces. It's not the British Army on its own. I'll go through three themes, if I may. Learning, training, and experimentation. Now, I think as many of you will always agree, there's been a, there's been a rhyme today, which has much been better described by the great poet Mark Twain. History sure does rhyme, and I think we can all concur on that. But hopefully on the slide there, I'll just highlight some points about how we're learning. Firstly, we're learning from history itself. Conducted a number of battlefield studies, once again, down to Sticky and others in the room who've guided us, to Warsaw and for my own brigade to Israel last summer, where we examined low-level tactical lessons from both Beirut and the Lebanon. Secondly, we've been relearning from our recent experience. And as Wolf described this morning, the Berlin Infantry Brigade, 5 Airborne Brigade in our near history, and Exercise King's Ride 5, a major experiment in the Ruleben fighting city in Berlin. And for those of you in uniform in green, they are excellent reports, and I commend them to you uh, to read. Thirdly, we're continuing to learn from our forward deployed forces in Iraq and Ukraine. And I'm very privileged, uh, being in the third division, to have some of my soldiers currently forward in Ukraine, uh, and of course in Wandiv, and through General Rupert as well, the lessons from Iraq. We've had a member on the excellent Mosul study group report, and we're seeking to learn not only from Mosul, but Raqqa, and of course the Armed Forces of Philippines experience, Adam Rawawi. The TTPs and the use of new technologies such as UAS, thermobaric weapons, and noting the global connectivity that, as David says, now enables people to mimic both non-state and state actors, those TTPs and lethality, is something we're watching very closely. My final observation about learning is we're also learning from our doctrine. I've actually read the Urban Doctrine. Uh, it did have a rewrite two or three years ago. Angus is cheering. Uh, it is quite excellent, actually, because we spent quite a lot of money, uh, quite a lot of time, and a lot of experience to rewrite it. And when it's coupled with integrated action, uh, it is something that I would commend to all as being very, very good. Now, our challenge, of course, is imparting this learning to our young men and women, those who will have to do the fighting. And uh, I gave the challenge to our young intelligence corporal uh, to try and pull this together about a year ago. Uh, and what he managed to do through the ISR Brigade is go on to open source and just take off of open source video all the stuff that's currently going on in urban fighting right now, which we then use to show our troops to try and demonstrate what's about to take place. And if you just indulge me for two minutes, Al, if you could run the video, please.
Thanks, Hull. So I guess, like many of you in the room, uh, some of you have been mentored by the late Professor Richard Holmes, who always talks about the constants and the variables of history and war fighting. And as you're watching that video there, I hope what leapt out to you uh, was the constant of operating amongst and around the people, the criticality of the maintenance and momentum, the three-dimensional warfare on ground, above ground, below the surface, cities and towns as connected systems, violence and endurance that could be required for our people to commit to, noting that, as ever, politics and the context of each urban fight will always be set on the prevailing strategic conditions, which can oscillate over time. I want to turn now, if I can, please, to training, because I think it's in our thinking and training that we'll gain ourselves the greatest advancements. Now, many in the room are already doing this. It's not just one brigade. Two para at unit level, seven brigade, 16 air assault, 38 brigade, specialized infantry brigades, are all engaging at formation level with how they do things in the urban environment. I would argue passionately a community of activity is underway about how to fight better, how to fight smart in and around the urban environment. Now for my own brigade, uh, as General Nick alluded to, uh, we're in Canary Wharf over the last 48 hours. David kindly join us. And the brigade were looking at armored ground maneuver and future strike fighting in complex terrain. It was literally amazing with how much came up from the focused discussions on a simple terrain walk planned by a young captain and major in the audience today. We have a significant amount of combat experience at command level in conventional and non-conventional forces. And we all have a high degree of realism in the tactics we might need and the key gaps we have. We're not ducking the key issues, but confronting them and working up solutions. And I would just add at the command level that that group there included the command of our air assault forces, commando forces, and specialized infantry. And you can tell we're all army officers, I'm sure. Turning to uh, training, because actually it's our junior leaders that quite rightly General Paul lays the challenge down to us. I'll be long retired, I hope, when the next urban fight comes. Uh, but it's about laying down conditions for our junior leaders. So Urban Dawn 1, which is about to start over the next two weeks, led by One Mercians, is a train-the-trainer package delivered around the country, not just Copal Down. We've got 32 sites in defence capability across the United Kingdom on which to train in. And by going around those facilities, what we're designing to do is to raise the confidence of our next generation of warfighting junior leaders to operate in the urban. What I want to do is read out the intent that the commanding officers set. I intend to train brigade lieutenants and corporals in modern urban operations using current British Army doctrine. We will remind and revise urban TTPs from subunit to team level, stressing combined arms at all time. We will teach modern urban tactics with lessons gleaned from current wars. We will educate attendees in the UK training sites available, 32, and show how other governmental agencies approach urban activities. There's a lot we can learn from other government agencies. We will investigate novel and modern urban techniques and equipment. We will study and evaluate current doctrine and recommend further areas for experimentation and training for armoured infantry brigades and strike brigades and recommend quick wins at low cost, no cost, within the fielded force. I think that's an excellent intent written by one of my COs. Now our focus is going to be about developing the micro and the macro tactics that we need, urban map reading, vertical, subterranean development, and a host of other things, including educating our people about 21st century objectives. It's not just the bridges, and the traffic intersections, but the fiber optic cables, the communication centers, and the power sources. And also educate our young leaders about seeing the urban as something that can assist them as they're perhaps fighting in other series of tactical actions, delay and defense. We may be going backwards, or fighting alongside forces under significant pressure at the start of the next fight. We're not just thinking about always going forward. Now, what we're also trying to do is to learn to leverage better the specialists we have. Army 2020 Refined set us up with some incredible accelerants that I would love to have had in Basra in 2007. There's the well-known 77 Brigade and the ISR Brigade, but given it's the engineer gathering, there is a host of other capabilities, Jack, that we know you have. Um, and I just highlight the engineer and logistics staff corps to understand best practice in matters such as subsurface communication, navigation and breathing apparatus, and of course, our highly prized and highly professional EOD capability to do detection and explosive denial as and when required. And we all understand the urban does need a lot of heavy use of engineers. 
What we're hoping to do is to inform short-term enhancements over the next three years to make urban training more realistic and more competitive. And as part of this, we'll inform future low-cost training aids, such as Simunition and Airsoft, to assist in replicating the fear of being shot and it hurting. Lasers don't necessarily do that. Smoke generators, laser lights, live firing battle inoculation to simulate the psychological and physical effects that we need to replicate in training. What we're after is more realistic, better informed and integrated training, which will allow the force to build competency within the urban environment. Simulation clearly offers opportunity in that. Our aiming mark is to train the urban muscle, the confidence to operate smartly and disciplined, and sorry, and with disciplined initiative when fighting amongst and around populations in cities. I would say it's not SWAT, stack, SWAT style tactics, it's not special forces, it's combined arms manoeuvre, uh, which is what we're trying to get at. I'll turn now to the third part and then finish on experimentation. Throughout the Urban Dawn series, we're also looking at experimenting to enable us to inform changes to warfare development and doctrine and recommend the optimal combat teaming for fight tonight and fight tomorrow. Now, over the next few months, we'll build the Urban Experimental Requirements List and nest it within the wider strike experimentation program. Our experimentation work will seek to build on the Urban Warrior series, for which we are immensely grateful, by identifying the optimal force structure, combat team, to operate within today's urban environment. The start point is to build on what General Paul and others discovered uh, from Urban Warrior. Uh, and effectively, uh, what we're trying to do is bring that up to date, unashamedly bring it up to date, with the advancements that have taken place uh, over the last four years. And I would just say that that report carries on the screen there, carries a huge uh, weight of credibility, because of course it was Royal Welsh soldiers, many of whom have fought in the streets of 2007 with a commanding officer in the audience so bravely and so magnificently. And I reread the port report about three days ago before I spoke here. It's amazing how many of those lessons remain enduring uh, to what was delivered. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna do Urban Dawn 2 in Cope Hill Down in March. What we're gonna do is look at the infantry company group in 2025. It's not gonna be 110 people. We know that, it needs to be slightly bigger. There's a heap of things that we're gonna test and trial with and see whether they're required. We don't know all the answers, so you could take a picture, but it might not look, look like that. It will include bulldozers, just again, to reassure those who are fans of that. Further experiments in the future will look at novel maneuver tactics, such as swarming and other asymmetric tactics. We'll look at the challenges of logistics resupply and further optimal combat teaming as we transition, as David's highlighted, the different stages of urban uh, terrain. And just for those of you in Berlin, one of my great commanding officers here at the RTR, we've painted a squadron in urban cam, and I know you've all seen that uh, on, uh, on Twitter. So many of you might challenge me in closing by saying how are you going to consolidate your gains? Well, to ensure this is done, Army Warfare Branch, along with the Chief of Staff Field Army, are establishing an urban ops steering group that will provide direction and coherence to the good work that's been continually done across the field army. It will guide efficiencies and, more importantly, capture lessons and recommendations for changes to be made in doctrine and training. We will continue with our twice re re yearly reports with General Chris to ECAB, where we will highlight honestly, as warfighters, the quick wins at no cost, quick wins at low cost, and what we might do better alongside and integrated with joint forces. We will, of course, be thinking about equipment. I know many of you are interested in that. AWE last year looked at the urban and we will always be focused on increasing lethality and survivability. Mounted, dismounted communications, ISR in the urban, target acquisition. My own memory, really low cost, high impact, capability we bought in 2007 was the laser ones to start guiding in the fast air and AH. Didn't cost much, but it made an exponential difference to those on the ground. So in summary, we're not going to answer everything and every question on the issue of the urban. As Michael Howard says, the challenge is to be close enough so that when we get to the next fight, we can accelerate into it. We'll continue to work collaboratively uh, with all our wider fellow field formation commanders in the Army and across the joint members of the force who are here today. I'd just like to put an advertisement up for Urban Dawn 3 in Shrivenham. In late August, we'll be looking at the next challenge, as Brigadier Angus highlighted, brigade and divisional level fights in the urban. In conclusion, just as in Iraq in that summer of 2007, the best ideas will always come bottom up. I invite you all to help us on this key journey to join this community of action that I do passionately believe is already underway to make us more competitive in combined arms manoeuvre in the 21st century. Thank you.